The Bad Batch Episode 11, Devil's Deal. Man, look at how many characters are on screen here. I remember back in the day on Clone Wars, they were technologically limited with their asset budget and could only have so many unique assets on screen at once. So you would inevitably get a lot of repeated faces. But where we are with technology now, it looks like there's not much of a limitation. Also, in terms of the story, it's neat that we're back on Ryloth revisiting the burgeoning rebellion here that began years ago in Clone Wars. Maybe we'll finally see that storyline wrap up. Oh, nice. Hera? Oh, wait, that can't be her. At this point in the timeline, she's a child still. See, this is the kind of politics that is interesting in Star Wars. In-universe galactic politics that affects the lives of the citizens of the galaxy, not like outside the material meta-politics from our real world and influencing the plot of Star Wars. I really like the conflict here of Orn Frita wanting peace, but what he's proposing isn't peace. It's giving into imperial rule and allowing their boot heel to forever hang over their heads. He's calling tyranny peace just because the fighting has stopped. But Cham Syndulla wants freedom and sovereignty to govern themselves. And he's somewhat of a populist. See, this stuff is interesting, and like I said before, it would have been nice to see the state of the galaxy's political structure in the sequel trilogy. Oh hey, I was right before. I was not expecting to see Child Hera and Chopper in here. That's pretty neat. And I gotta say, having them in this animation style looks leagues better than they did in Rebels animation. Rebels is by no means bad looking, obviously nothing will look as bad as Resistance, but it was definitely a lower budget show, and having this show set where it is in the timeline allows Dave Filoni to continue hanging plot threads from the Clone Wars and set the stage for where Rebels begins. It's neat to see all these shows intertwining here. Also, they've basically gotten all the old voice actors back. This is clearly Vanessa Marshall, and she's doing the French accent she had as a kid, and she occasionally used in Rebels. Never, ever give up your weapons, especially to an authoritarian regime. That'd be just stupid. 2A applies to the Star Wars Galaxy 2 just as well as it does in real life. Kind of weird seeing a company like Disney be sort of based in this show when we know they really aren't like this. They cater to a global audience, and these values are not shared worldwide, obviously. Expect many family cosplay groups at the next Star Wars celebration of Hera, her mother, and Cham, and maybe their dog is Chopper. Based Gobi. You know it's pretty bad that I'm way more invested in the political intrigue of an animated Star Wars quote-unquote kid show than I was for nearly anything in the entire last live-action trilogy. <sighs> what could have been? Hera is kind of a rip-off of Luke Skywalker, really. Young, idealistic person who wants to fly to get off their planet. Except the difference is Luke spent years flying and learned how to do it. Unlike Hera... Well, we'll get to that scene. That's in the next episode. Okay, I have to bring this up. I can't get over how much Cham in this show reminds me so much of the Ubisoft CEO, Eve Gimo. Seriously, go pull up a picture of him. Or in fact, here's one right now. We see him every E3, so I know we, we know what he looks like. It's hilarious how similar they look. And he's French, too. Wasn't there a Dunium mine in that book, Star Wars A New Dawn? I know this isn't a channel based on books or the medium of literature in general, but I have read a few new canon books, and I think I remember Hera being in that one and also Dunium. There definitely was a mine of some sort. Oh, you sweet summer child. That's literally every government in the history of existence. They feign sympathy and pretend to care to only ensure their own power over you. Honestly, I wonder if this show actually is intended for older audiences instead of kids, because some of these complex political themes and situations will just go over the kids' heads. Wait, really? You're going to have her fly on this very crucial supply run? Seems risky. How much flight experience does she even have? See? He's giving her like a crash course on flying now? Let's be honest, this is probably a setup for later on in some series where they reunite. Because post-Return of the Jedi, they are probably both still alive. I mean, that's pretty sensible, right? That's what pilots have to do in the real world. You have to know all the meters and the buttons and technical jargon like the back of your hand before you even think about your first takeoff. Um, no, not really. The feeling of flying isn't going to matter when you're low on fuel and can't even read the fuel gauge. Or if you can't read the altimeter and you fly straight into a mountain... I don't think the quote-unquote feeling of flight is going to matter much. Well, yeah, you're going to feel that when you're down on terra firma dreaming about it and not actually doing something that requires years of training and skill, like maneuvering a huge hunk of metal through the atmosphere and out in the vacuum of space, where one wrong move can be the end of you. Your idealized version of flying and the reality of flight are not remotely the same thing. It would be different if she was always flying something like the Skyhopper that Luke flies on his farm. He did that for years, so it made sense why he was able to fly an X-Wing. How does that work? The gunner's mount is your room until you start getting shot at, and then what? Do you quickly throw out everything in your room to use the gunner seat properly? Won't you be shot down by the time you do that? Ugh, no. She's been taught incorrectly. Hera's weird, feelsy explanation of flight has infected her. Right? That's what I'm saying. That's a really bizarre ship design. It looks like somebody took a scale model of the USS Enterprise and folded it in half. It's got a similar dish section and the two big thrusters. Man, that sure is purdy. Looks almost like an image of real clouds. 
Jeez, how powerful is Crosshair's gun? It must be like a Star Wars equivalent of a Barrett 50 cal in the real world to take out a whole engine like that. Otherwise, you'd think you'd just bounce off some metal and just leave a scoring mark. Man, why so much backup? Do you really need a gunship, some speeder bikes, and a freaking turbo tank to come get these guys? Seems a little overkill. However, I do love those clone turbo tanks, and any chance to see them again, I'll take. The animation on those shock absorbers on the turbo tank is so slick. Those little details they wouldn't have even bothered animating back in the day during Clone Wars. That Disney money basically gives them unlimited resources for animation. I really enjoyed the big action scene that preceded this, and here I honestly thought Cham would actually shoot him. Holy crap, it was a setup. Basically a false flag operation by the Empire. And now they're going to frame Cham. And it basically ends on a cliffhanger, so we're getting one of those multiple episode arcs. And that's the end of that episode. But I'm just going to jump right into the next one, because this is a double up this time. I thought this one was one of the better ones of the season. Didn't expect us to revisit the ongoing Ryloth arc from Clone Wars and Rebels, so it was cool to see that continue. Maybe we'll revisit it again in some post-Return of the Jedi set new project. So, on to episode 12, Rescue on Ryloth. It starts off basically immediately where the last one left off. Ah, Cham Guillemo, CEO of Ubisoft. Or maybe even Eve Syndulla, now the traitor of Ubisoft. I mean, kinda. Admiral Rampart? More like Admiral Gaslighter, am I right? Once again, this episode of The Bad Batch brought to you by Burger King. Arresting all of the sympathizers of a man with orange skin? Doesn't seem too far off from current day America. Are you, though? I'm not so sure you can call yourself a defective when you could inexplicably do almost anything without trying very hard with nearly no training. Not exactly a defect, more like a gift. A shameless retread of the help me Obi-Wan Kenobi you're my only hope scene. She's even in the same pose that Leia was. I mean, he's not wrong. Lol what? Half this show has been you overreacting and doing things that could get you killed. You're proving his point. Obviously, it turns out that she did need their help, but Tech's point about children overreacting is fundamentally correct in most cases. This is also true. They can't be the galaxy police and help literally everyone everywhere at all times, obviously. No, not really. They have a commanding officer that has them go to places where they can help. Keyword, can. Soldiers aren't omniscient, all-powerful beings that can come to everyone's rescue. Come on, this is like basic stuff, and she's being overly emotional about it. I'm not saying they shouldn't go help her. In this case, it made sense since Ryloth is losing its freedom under Imperial rule. But like I said, as a general rule, they can't help everyone. It's not even possible. Really, Hunter? Come on. Why are you always a pushover with Omega? He's done this several times this season, where he's made up his mind on something and will not budge, but then somehow he changes his mind if Omega complains enough? Writers, stop making Hunter a cuck that folds one under any pressure from a child. You keep taking his personal agency away, and he's just at the whim of Omega's command. It's this weird, the kids always know best mentality this show has sometimes. It's harder to take him seriously when he keeps doing this. Wait, what? Why on earth would you hide at your father's old command outpost when they are looking for his sympathizers? Isn't that one of the first places they would look? That seems incredibly stupid. You know, as iconic as the Imperial probe droids are, it is kind of weird how this is how they look in every piece of Star Wars content. You're telling me the Empire didn't make any other designs? They just had the exact same design of probe droid that makes the same sounds for decades and never improved it or changed it? Kind of weird. You know, I've thought about this a lot over the course of this show. With Crosshair being as highly skilled as he is and Jango's DNA starting to no longer work, I'm starting to think that they will use Crosshair's DNA as a template for the Death Troopers. They have the accuracy, they're more elite than standard Stormtroopers. They even have the green visor like he does. Maybe they'll give him a voice scrambler by the end of this show, too, and he'll be the very first Death Trooper. I guess we'll see. More real-world similarities. More pearls of wisdom from Hunter that he will inevitably abandon after listening to sufficient complaining from Omega until she ultimately gets her way. Man, this show tries really hard to be like, see? She's the better person. She knows better than Hunter. They constantly try to make her look like the righteous one with a greater moral foundation than Hunter, despite her being a kid. It's trying to get the viewer to be like, uh, Hunter, why won't you do the right thing like Omega? I hate it. Obviously, this episode was probably written over a year ago, but I bet anything that Disney probably regrets having an episode where their heroes attack the C-A-P-I-T-O-L. I'm trying to avoid my channel being nuked of a major government after certain events earlier this year, but more on that later. And by later, I mean right now. Okay, so I don't intend to discuss current day real world politics on this channel, and sometimes it does come up tangentially related to a piece of media I'm discussing like it is here, but don't think this will be a normal thing or that this will be a politics related channel, because it won't be. But there were just way too many bizarre parallels to real life in this episode that I couldn't not mention them. So in this one episode, we have our heroes of the show, including a guy with face paint, Scaling the wall of the C-A-P-I-T-O-L of a major government entity, 
which is currently under military occupation and will undoubtedly be under even more security after this. And all of this happens because the newly installed authoritarian regime of the Empire is cracking down on all dissidents and spying on and arresting loyal followers of a well-liked leader of a populist movement with orange skin after he is framed in a pseudo-false flag event, in, this, in the case of this show, a faked assassination attempt, and in the case of the real world, the authority is letting people walk right in, which is being used to further oppress the citizens. Hmm. Hmm. This is the part where I would throw some images on screen, comparing images from the show and then some from real life, and show the shocking similarities, but I don't feel like getting on YouTube's bad side. Also, a note to whichever low-paid intern is probably watching this at YouTube HQ to approve this video for upload due to probably getting manually reviewed. Don't flag me or ban me, bro. I don't intend to get any more political than that on this channel. I'm just pointing out the bizarre coincidences of this episode's script in America in 2021. Please have mercy on me, Susan Wojcicki, and don't algorithmically suppress me now because I said some things you don't like. Okay, I'm moving on now. Back to the fictional world. Wait, what? Are you crazy? You have very little flight experience and you just hopped in here and, and you know how to fly this thing? Come on. You're sort of retroactively harming Hera's character in Rebels by doing this. Man, these two are just two peas in a pod, aren't they? Characters with very little experience of the world, inexplicably knowing how to do these difficult things with ease because we need the plot to happen. Oops. Derp. I almost just killed a bunch of my own fellow Twi'leks, but no biggie. Lol. Well, if you call flying some shuttle she's never stepped foot in before and doing some dangerous maneuvers in safe, then sure, she's positively peachy. You know, I think I forgot to bring up this point before, but Crosshair doesn't seem to be too damaged after his little incident where his face got blasted by a Star Destroyer engine. I thought he'd be down for the count for a while and maybe even have lost his dead-eye aim and maybe some partial blindness. But no, he's just as much of a crack shot as he ever was. And so soon. And no serious burns, really. Just that bit on the side of his head, despite in that episode having the front of his face toasted, too. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 hold up. Just hold up a minute. Wait just a minute. What about Order 66? Did Hauser get his chip removed? Why is he not trying to kill them? Yeah, they're not Jedi, but haven't we been shown before that they're also trained to kill traitors to the Empire? Sight unseen? The way the chips work is confusing and ill-defined. They seem to be keeping it purposely vague so they can still do things like this. Because stuff like this with defecting clones is way more interesting than turning them into mindless drones controlled by a chip. Maybe it turned out to be a mistake by George to canonize the chips, because back in the old EU Clone Wars comics... Before the show started, they didn't have them. It seems like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. But how? They're all chipped too. What? That's all it took? Just Hauser saying, Guys, this is wrong and I won't participate anymore. Who's with me? And they just start throwing down their stuff? Talk about easily convinced. And it still raises more questions I have about how the chips work. Dang, Hauser, what a chad. He let himself become a prisoner of the Empire to save the Sindulas. Wait, that's something you can be taught? You don't need special equipment for that? Can any ship do that? Yep, I guarantee they will find a way to shoehorn them into a scene again together in some future project. Keep an eye on them? What? No, they need to keep an eye on Omega. She's reckless. What is she on about? She's been reckless from day one. Isn't that kind of what you've been doing this whole time in this show? And that's it for this episode and that two-episode arc. Unless, of course, it continues, but I don't think it's going to. I think we're going to move on to something else. I'm sure we'll see Ryloth again, but probably not in this show. I know I'm late. I'm very late. The last episode is well over a week late, and I'm several days late on the most recent one. So I just decided, hey, I'll do what I did before once, which was uh, combine the two episodes into one. And I guess it turned out for the best this time because these two felt like one long episode this time. It was like a 40-minute episode they cut in half. So I guess the double up was fine. Uh, after this, I believe we have only four episodes left. So uh, I am planning to do four episodes for that, but... If something else comes up, I'll maybe do a double up. So there might between be between two to four episodes left of my breakdowns for this. So if the last two feel like one big movie or, or one big episode, I might combine those as well. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. So thank you for joining me on this uh, extra long episode of my Bad Batch breakdown. And I hope you'll join me in watching my next few till we lead up to the finale. And then I won't have any new Star Wars content to cover until... December with Book of Boba Fett, so that's kind of exciting. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.